So when I say symmetric function today, what I really mean is a symmetric polynomial <coughs> in infinitely many variables. I guess that needs some elaboration. Let me elaborate. Infinitely many variables, x1, x2, x3, dot, dot, dot. These are my variables. And um, I look at multi-indices. A multi-index is just a sequence of non-negative integers. of which at most finite, well, of which finitely many are positive. Once you have these variables and this multi-index, you can write x to the alpha. This denotes x1 to the alpha 1, x2 to the alpha 2. That's just a finite product because only finitely many of these alpha i's are positive, and if alpha is zero, then you don't, it doesn't contribute anything to the product. That's a monomial. That's a monomial in infinitely many variables. You have all these monomials, infinitely many of them, and uh, the shape of a monomial. is, well, starting with a, I'll call this a multi-index. Starting with a multi-index, you get a partition by rearranging the parts, uh, the non-zero, the positive parts, uh, the positive integers occurring in the multi-index in weekly decreasing order. the partition obtained from alpha by arranging its positive entries by in decreasing order. With all this notation, I'm ready to define what is a homogeneous symmetric function. It's just a formal infinite sum. Okay, one more piece of notation I forgot to define. I'll define the size of alpha, which I'll denote by this absolute value symbol, to be just a sum of its entries. Okay, so that's the size of a multi-index. Now, this degree n means I should look at monomials of degree n. This is a monomial of degree size of alpha. So, what I'll write is alpha n c alpha x to the alpha. Well, that's a polynomial. The symmetric part comes in when I say that c alpha, now we'll keep some field in mind, call it k. And we'll just ask that c alpha depends only on shape of alpha. So, C of the coefficient of x1 squared x3 should be the same as the coefficient of 
x5 squared x1. They have the same shape, these monomials. So this has the monomial, uh, this has the multi index 2, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. This has the multi index 1, 0, 0, 0, 0 5, 0, 0. Uh, sorry, 1, 0, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0. So, but they have the same shape. And this is why they are called symmetric. If you take any infinite, you know, any permutation of this set 1 to n of the natural numbers, then this thing won't change. And you accordingly replace the variables, then this thing will not change. So clear what's meant by this? It's just a formal thing. They're not functions in the modern set theoretic sense of the word function. They're functions in the classical sense. Okay, and one more thing I should use for notation, lambda, capital lambda, k, n. This is the space of homogeneous symmetric functions of degree n. What is lambda? k 0. This is always something that needs a little explanation. The definition literally taken, absolute value of alpha equals 0, size of alpha equals 0 means that all the parts of alpha should be 0. So what is the shape of that? The shape of that is the empty partition of 0. Okay, 0 has only one partition, the empty partition which has no parts at all. And that's the only um, only shape allowed for degree zero, and therefore this is one dimension. It's just k itself. That's a thing to note. All the other ones, the, the, you'll definitely get infinite sums. If you take any other shape, then there are infinitely many monomials of that shape because there are infinitely many variables. But it still makes sense to multiply all these guys even though each of these things unless it is constant has infinitely many terms it still makes sense to multiply all these guys. If you have f in wedge it's it called lambda m k and g in lambda n k then you can think of f times g in lambda m plus n k why does this make sense it makes sense because okay to multiply two polynomials what do you do you figure out the coefficient of each monomial in the product who suppose you fix some multi index alpha who can contribute to the coefficient of x to the alpha. If you think about it, you will see there are only finitely many terms from f and finitely many terms from g which can contribute because the guys who contribute should have lower powers of each variable than the monomial you are trying to get. So, so this still makes sense and if you write lambda k as the infinite direct sum n goes from 0 to infinity lambda k n, this becomes what is called a graded k algebra. It is infinite dimensional. The graded business just means that the multiplication, if you multiply something in the mth part and something in the nth part, the homogeneous parts, then you get something in the m plus nth part. That's what graded means. This is a graded K algebra. The most natural examples of symmetric functions are the monomial symmetric functions. 
the coefficients of a symmetric function depend on the shape of the multi index you just fix a shape and you can construct a symmetric function of that shape by putting all the coefficients of multi indices of that shape to be 1 and all other shapes to be 0. m lambda is defined as sum over all multi indices of shape lambda of the monomials corresponding to those multi indices. For example, what is m of the empty partition? Take a wild guess. One. One. Okay. Because you'll just be taking shape of alpha to be the empty partition, x to the nothing. I mean, so so you get one. Literally following the definition. What is m one? So you just take monomials which have only one non-zero part, and that part is one. So you get x1 plus x2 plus x3. What is m2? That's x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared. What about m11? The multi indices you are taking will have two non zero parts, each of which will be one. Now, the order does not matter. I mean, okay, the answer is this take i less than j. You do not want to repeat xi, xj, and xj, xi, these variables commute. So, you just take each of those ones. And let us do a slightly more interesting one. Here, the order does matter because one of them will be raised to the power 2 and the other will be raised to the power 1. So, if we interchange x i and x j, you get a different monomial. i not equal to j. i not equal to j, thanks. That is very important. I hope that by now this first theorem is obvious that the monomial symmetric functions form a basis. If you take all the partitions of n, then the corresponding monomial symmetric functions form a basis of this vector space lambda k n. That's that's uh, more or less trivial. Let's look at the first interesting non-trivial class of symmetric functions. These you may have seen from more elementary algebra courses. They are called elementary symmetric functions. I define E n to be m 1 to the n. That means 1 repeated n times. This guy here is E 2. This you can think of as summation over I 1 less than I 2 less than I n x i 1 x i 2 x i in each monomial each variable is raised to the power at most 1 that is e n and for any partition lambda you define e lambda to be e lambda 1 e lambda 2 
the product of the e lambda i's if lambda is lambda 1 lambda for every partition you've defined an elementary symmetric function i'll call that the elementary symmetric function of shape lambda okay let's try to express the elementary symmetric functions in terms of the monomial symmetric function and the answer is uh, a bit surprising presentation theory of symmetric groups the answer is the following if lambda is a partition of n then e lambda is summation over mu n mu lambda m mu where n mu lambda is something which we've seen before it's the number of 0 1 lambda by mu matrices this is the thing that appears on the left hand side of the dual rsk correspondence let me just remind you it means matrices whose um, well i guess the way i've written it i should say mu by lambda the i through adds up to mu i and the jth column adds up to lambda j for each i and j. Why is this so? Just look at this picture x1, x2, x3 dot 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 x1, x2, x3 and so on. Now, if I want to get a monomial in E lambda, I am multiplying E lambda 1 by E lambda 2 by E lambda 3 by E lambda 4. So, I have to choose one monomial in each E lambda i. What is a monomial in E lambda i? You have to choose lambda distinct variables from this row. Sorry, you have to choose lambda 1 distinct variables from this row. You have to choose lambda 2 distinct variables from this row lambda 3 distinct variables from this row and so on. Okay. What if you want that product to be x to x1 to the power mu 1, x2 to the power mu 2, x3 to the power mu 3. If you want that to happen, then you should have chosen x1 mu 1 times. You should have chosen x2 mu 2 times. You should have chosen x3 mu 3 times. So you can record that in a by saying, okay, you look at which ones I've chosen, I put ones there, and everywhere else I put zeros. Then the row sums will be the mu's. Uh, the row sums will be sorry. So I want the thing to be x to the power mu, right? So and um, yeah, so the row sums will be actually the lambdas, and the column sums will be the mu's. That's not exactly what we want, but it doesn't matter because that gives us E lambda is n lambda mu m mu, but n lambda mu is n mu lambda because you can always take a mu by lambda 0, 1 matrix and transpose it to get a lambda by mu 0, 1 matrix and vice versa. So these have the same cardinalities. I hope this proof is clear. Anyway, I've written it down in the notes as well. It will be convenient now to introduce a matrix notation for writing down identities like the one I just proved, the one that gives you the transition between monomial symmetric functions and elementary symmetric functions. What you do is you enumerate the partitions, enumerate this. in such a way that you 
if lambda is less than or equal to mu, then lambda appears before mu. In some sense, I'm saying that you have this partial order, reverse dominance, and you take, uh, you know, it's, it's a relation. Now you strengthen this relation by adding more less than or equal to signs till you get a linear order. It's always possible to do this. When you have a partial order, you can always strengthen it to a linear order. That's called a linear extension of a partial order. I'll let you think about that. So all I'm saying is that you take these partitions and arrange them in a you know, sequential order in such a way that if lambda is less or equal to mu, then lambda appears before mu. We looked at some small examples where anyway it was a linear order. But once you go to larger ends, the reverse dominance order is not a linear order. Okay. Once you do that, you can enumerate anything that is indexed by the partition. I'll write m vector for the row vector whose coordinates are m lambda, enumerated in that order. Then I'll write n for the matrix whose lambda mu entry is n subscript lambda mu. And I'll write E vector for E lambda. Then what I've proved just now is that E is equal to m. These are actually vectors of vectors, so they are a bit funny. But that still makes sense. And this is exactly equivalent to the equation there, expressing the E lambdas in terms of the m mu. See, that just gets a matrix which is easier to handle, more intuitive. Let me remind you of the dual RSK correspondence. says that, well, at the counting level, it says it's actually a bijective correspondence, but the formula that it gives you is that n lambda mu is summation mu less than or equal to lambda, mu prime less than or equal to mu k mu lambda, k mu prime. OK, let me try to write this in matrix notation. So firstly, I have to introduce this matrix K, which is K um, K lambda mu. OK, this, is, um, this makes perfect sense if lambda is less than or equal to mu. If lambda is not less than or equal to mu, I'll say it's 0. Therefore, this becomes an upper triangular. And the other thing is that the diagonal entries are all equal to 1, because k lambda lambda is equal to 1. If this were not a new prime, then this would be k transpose k, this sum. But there is this new prime, so we need to handle that. I'll just introduce a permutation matrix. So j is the matrix which, if you multiply some matrix on the left by, you'll end up interchanging the new throw with the new prime throw. So that just means that the lambda muth entry of this is 
lambda prime mu. The entry is 0 unless mu is the prime of lambda. This is a permutation matrix of order 2. And the permutation is a bunch of disjoint transpositions. You take the pairs where nu and nu prime are distinct and just interchange them. If nu is equal to nu prime, you don't do anything to that. And this dual RSK correspondence in matrix notation just says n is equal to k prime j k. Right off, you can read off the determinant of n is, well, this has determinant 1, this has determinant 1, this has determinant plus or minus 1 depending on n. So determinant of n is plus or minus 1. And that gives you the fact that this identity going from monomial symmetric polynomials to elementary symmetric, monomial symmetric functions to elementary symmetric functions is invertible even over the integers. Because you can write down the inverse of n, its determinant being 1, that will again be an integer matrix. Therefore, also over any field. Just one question. Yes, one question. Partitions of all, right? like the, the big lattice of partitions This only refer so your question is what happens if we vary n? Yeah. Right now we are not varying n, we are fixing n and looking at this relation. Okay? When you vary n, you'll see that this well for this theorem there'll be no problem because there's no condition. The determinant is plus or minus 1, independent of n. So you go from m to e by a non-singular transformation, which is non-singular over any field, no matter what its characteristic, because the determinant is plus or minus 1. If the determinant was 5, then maybe in a field of characteristic 5, we'd end up with singular matrix. You get that E lambda as lambda runs over partitions of n is a basis of the homogeneous symmetric polynomials of degree n. Now these E lambdas themselves are monomials in the E n's. So what this is saying is that lambda k is just the polynomial algebra in E1. Every element of lambda k is a linear combination of monomials in E1, E2, E3. That's another way of stating this for any field k. The historical significance of this theorem, it actually has a rather nice name. It's called the fundamental theorem of symmetric functions. Its historical significance is that suppose you take a polynomial and you factorize it. Um, I'll write the polynomial as xn minus a1 x to the n minus 1 plus a2 x to the Yes, these pluses and minuses alternate. Okay, so by that rule, the last entry, you'll have to figure out what its thing is. But here's a monic polynomial with coefficients in k. Let's assume that k is algebraically closed. Then I can definitely write it as product i goes from 1 to n x minus lambda i 
not to be confused with the parts of lambda. These are just the roots of this polynomial, counted, listed with multiplicity. Then what is the relation? A i is related to these lambda i's as the height elementary symmetric polynomial of the lambdas. So what you do is you put lambda 1 up to lambda n, and then you put in zeros. You only bother with finitely many variables. And therefore, what this statement becomes is the rather nice statement that every symmetric polynomial in the roots of a polynomial is a polynomial in its coefficients. And doing that, expressing it is amounts to understanding the transition between monomial symmetric functions and elementary symmetric functions. Sir, so we have it defined lambda k in terms of, and, uh, do we know that given any element in lambda k and given any bijection of n? Sorry? So given any bijection of natural numbers yeah. and given any element in lambda k, uh -huh. uh, do we know, is it very clear that that bijection will leave the polynomial unaltered? Because your question is, suppose I have a bijection of the natural numbers, and I take a symmetric function, and I sub substitute for each variable. For xi, I, take, I replace it by x sigma i, where sigma is the bijection of the natural yeah. numbers. Will I get back the same yeah. symmetric function? You haven't defined it that way. Right? No, I haven't defined it that way. but you will get back the same symmetric function because when you do this substitution, the shape of the multi-index, basically what you're doing is you're <coughs> taking a multi-index and using this permutation of the natural numbers to rearrange the entries of the multi-index. But the shape of the multi-index doesn't change. And when I defined it, I said that the coefficients depend only on the shape of the multi-index. So it doesn't change. In fact, the motivation, motivating idea is precisely that. If you rearrange the order of the variables, then the polynomial should not change. It was just a way of stating it that I chose to do. And so if you just restrict the number of variables, you get that every symmetric function is? Here, what we've done is we've taken n variables and set the rest to be 0. You can always do this. You can, for every n, you can just um, set the n plus 1, n plus 2, and so on variables to be 0 and do whatever calculation you're doing. There's, there's, that's called specialization. Some elementary symmetric polynomials or monomial uh, symmetric functions will not show up when you do that. If, if each of the monomials has a, has a variable that's after n, then it will just disappear. Some things get killed, but for example, you can try to specialize the relation between monomial symmetric functions and elementary symmetric. And so on, so long as you're working with at least n variables, that still works. And that's implicit when I say this. Here you would take lambda k to be symmetric polynomials in n variables, and here you would take e1 up to e n. So I've really swept some things under the rug here. I was just trying to say what the historical significance is. Usually, you don't prove it this way. They're much more simple, I mean, you know, down-to-earth proofs. But since we proved the dual RSK correspondence using the RSK correspondence and the character theory of symmetry groups, it would be a pity not to use it here. Anyway, it's a unifying idea. This factorization, too, will be quite useful later. OK, let's, let's come to the next one, family. They're called complete symmetric. <coughs> Define H n 
to be m n. What's that? That's just the monomials of shape. You know, they have only one non-zero entry, and that's n. And you define h lambda to be h lambda one, h lambda two. If lambda is lambda one, you do this for every partition lambda. <coughs> you can ask what is the relation between these should be expressible as linear combinations of monomial symmetric functions. So how does that work? And this time again, the answer takes us back to something we saw when we were studying representations of symmetric groups. This time you get m h lambda is summation mu m mu lambda capital M mu lambda m u where this capital M mu lambda is the number of non matrices with non negative integer entries row sums mu and column sums lambda what I call the mu by lambda matrices. The proof is very similar now again you write down this array of variables x1 x2 x3 x1 x2 x3 now what does it mean to um, to, to look at a monomial in the expansion of this thing. So I have terms like this. Oh, whoops, I, I, I think this is not what I wanted to say. Hn is not, this is a called the power sum. It complete means all monomials of degree n. So let me rewrite that. What I want is all monomials of uh, degree n. Every single thing of degree n that you can write, write it down once. And that's clearly symmetric because it depends only on the shape. Whatever the shape is, it's one. It doesn't even depend on the shape. Okay. Right. So that's the complete symmetric function. Now, how do I find a monomial in this expansion? Well, this means that I can choose some number of x1, some number of x2s, and so on, but the total should be lambda 1 from the first row, lambda 2 from the second row, and so on. So I'm choosing lambda 1 variables from the first row with replacement. I can choose x1 and then I can choose x1 again. It's not like if once I've chosen x1, I can't choose it, choose it again. So if you record that, you lose from last time the restriction that these matrices should have entries 0 and 1 only. Everything else remains the same. The row sums still need to be lambda and the column sums still need to be mu. So what you get is that the coefficient of x1 to the lambda Okay, so yeah, so you'll get that the coefficient of x1 to the mu1, x2 to the mu2, and so on will be m mu lambda. Well, it'd be m, m lambda mu a priori, but that's the same as m mu lambda. So the proof is quite similar. So I hope that proof is clear. People look quite convinced. So if you instead of writing it where the power sums. Yeah, we'll come to that. So that then becomes a little more complicated. If you write the power sums here, then you'd have to write x1 to the power uh, lambda 1, x2 to the power lambda 1, x3 to the power lambda 1. So you couldn't do it quite the same way. Which is why I realized I had written the wrong definition. But then no. From them, you get that the Newton polynomial will generate all the symmetric polynomials. We'll come to the power sums in a moment. Let me just write this down in matrix notation and see what it means. You can take the RSK correspondence itself. 
What does it say? RSK correspondence says that m mu lambda equals sum mu less than or equal to mu, mu less than or equal to lambda, k mu mu k mu lambda, right? That's just saying that m is k prime k. And that's a matrix of determinant 1. So this thing that we got here, h is m times m, where m is the matrix whose lam mu lambda entry is m mu lambda, determinant m is actually 1. And so again, you get that h lambda, where lambda runs over partitions of n, is a basis of when lambda k, and for any field k, whatever its characteristic. Now I'll come to power sum symmetric functions. This is a little more of a nuisance than before, but also more interesting. And this is where, so far, we've only had hints that this should have something to do with the representation theory of symmetric groups. Now it will really show up in a serious way. Now you do what I was trying to do earlier. You define Pn to be Mn. So that's just x1 to the n plus x2 to the n. And you define P lambda to be P lambda 1, P lambda 2. OK, what's the transition matrix here? And this is where the representation theory comes in. Define P subscript lambda mu. So I'm going to define a matrix to be the trace of w mu on k, well, strictly kx lambda. Remember, this is the set of ordered partitions of shape lambda. I need to tell you what w mu is. Mu is a partition of n. W mu is an element of the symmetric group with that cycle decomposition. More specifically, I'll just take W mu to be the thing whose cycle decomposition is 1 up to um, mu 1, then mu 1 plus 1 up to mu 1 plus mu 2, mu 1 plus mu 2 plus 1. And so on. Clear? Yeah. The assertion is that you take this element of the symmetric group or anything in its conjugacy class, you compute its trace in this permutation representation. That, remember, is just the number of fixed points in the set for w mu. So it's not really that much of a representation theory statement as yet. It's just saying that you look at the action of this on this set, and you count the number of fixed points, and call that p lambda mu. Then the theorem is that p mu, OK, this time I can't wantonly interchange lambda and mu, so I'll write this down a little more carefully. I mean, m and n were symmetric matrices. This p is not a symmetric matrix. Is for any partition of n, it's given by p mu is given by p lambda mu. Yes. 
I can erase this, right? Just to be close to this. How does this work? We'll try the same trick, but now we have to be a little more careful. Certainly to get a monomial in the expansion of P lambda, I need to take, oh well, here it's P mu. So to get a monomial in the expansion of P mu, I need to take this array, x1 to the mu1, x2 to the mu2, and so on. And um, then I have to choose one of these guys. Then I have to choose, I take, sorry, x1 to the mu1, x2 to the mu1. Right? Then I take x1 to the mu2, x2 to the mu2, and uh, so on. Maybe I'll just write down one more row. Now the thing is, to get a monomial in PMU, I must pick one entry from each row. Now that monomial is x1 to the lambda 1, x2 to the lambda 2, x3 to the lambda 3, if and only if the sum of the mu i's for which I picked x j is lambda j. Get x1 to the lambda 1, x2 to the lambda 2, if and only if the sum of the mu i's for which I picked x i is lambda j. That's just the condition that you need to get x to the to get this one over there. Okay. What are we looking for really? We want to know that that's the number of fixed points for w mu, mu in k x lambda. Now, when is a partition, ordered partition of shape lambda fixed by w mu? You write down a partition. Now, w mu has got these cycles. It's going to be fixed by w mu if and only if um, each of these cycles lies entirely inside one of the parts of the partition. Because then you just move around stuff within that partition. It won't mix up the parts of the partition. So it will fix that partition. So we want to construct ordered partitions whose parts are unions of the cycles of W. So here's how I'll do it. I'll write down the cycles of W mu. I'll associate to each of these rows one cycle of W. So the first cycle is 1 to mu 1. I'll associate it to the first row. The second row, I'll associate the second cycle, mu 1 plus 1 up to mu 1 plus mu 2. And to the third row, I'll associate mu 1 plus mu 2 plus 1 up to mu 1 plus mu 2, and so on. So to each, to each uh, part, I've associated a subset of size mu i. And I'll construct my partition as follows. SI is the union of subsets. By subsets, I mean these guys, subsets of N, associated to the parts where XI is picked, or rather XI to the mu i is picked. 
what will those powers add up to? They'll add up to lambda i. That is the condition that you know I end up getting x1 to the lambda 1, x2 to the lambda 2, and so on. Which means that the cardinality of Si will be precisely lambda i. So this S union S1, S equals S1 union, S2 union. This is actually a partition of n whose shape is lambda. And its parts are unions of the cycles of W mu. So it's a partition, an ordered partition of 1 to n, which is fixed by W. Conversely, if you have an ordered partition that is fixed by W mu, again its parts are unions of the cycles of W mu, and it corresponds to some choice of these variables, one from each row. That proves this theorem, the transition between monomial symmetric functions and power sum symmetric functions. We can write that in matrix notation. What is this P lambda mu? Remember, it's just trace of W mu on Kx lambda. We prove using the RSK correspondence that this is the sum <coughs> over nu less than or equal to lambda K mu lambda trace of <coughs> W mu V lambda. This is the simple representation of Sn. I am assuming that the characteristic of k is greater than n. Then we had that kx lambda is the sum of the v lambdas with uh, v nu, sorry, with multiplicity k nu lambda. This was a consequence of the RSK correspondence. Let's call this x new lambda okay this this thing then what this is saying in matrix notation is that p is k prime x the transpose of k times x therefore the determinant of p is the same as the determinant of x Do we know anything about the determinant of x? What is x? x is basically the character table of Sn. So it gives you the values of characters on different conjugacy classes. Now the space of class functions has a basis which is the characteristic functions of the characteristic classes and another basis which is the irreducible characters. If you're working over a algebraically closed field where the characteristic does not divide the order of the group, since the character table is essentially telling you what the second basis is in for terms of the first basis, it must be a non-singular matrix. So we know that this is non-zero because it's the character table. We get a much more qualified statement in the case of power sum symmetric functions that if the characteristic of k is greater than n, and this is where an earlier question comes in, do we want to vary n or not? 
So the statement is different for different n. So for you need to assume that the characteristic. So actually, I don't need k to be algebraically closed. About why that is. Yeah, so P lambda is a basis of. Okay, this is a slick proof, but it's possible to do this in a much more down to earth way you can show that P is actually a triangular matrix and compute its diagonal entries and then get an exact value for the determinant of P. If you do it that way, then this identity can turn into a calculation of the determinant of the character table of the symmetric group. I leave that as an exercise to you. It's not very difficult. If you assume that K is not, is not algebraically closed, then